now. Okay. Oh. And we're going okay. there. All right. All right. I barely know what I'm doing. I pre-gamed a little much. <laughs> Listen, well, you're in good company because I am a crazy person. Um, yeah. Listen, we're going to be great. All right. Here we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Unsolved Mysteries Edition. My name is Lauren Ash. How's everybody feeling? As always, I am joined by my intrepid co-host, my sister, my cousin, the love of my life, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Uh, I've been, I've been pre-gaming a bit. Um, <laughs> Out of the gate. We're, we're, uh, we're recording this a little, like, just like a little later than we normally yes. do. Yes. Um, and that time difference, I think, is killing us because now we're two hours apart. So finding right. time to uh, connect gets difficult. But I was like, you know what? I've got a little bit of time. And I don't normally, like, when I have a little bit of time, I'm like, okay, I'll research this or whatever. But I've already researched um, for this one. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And the answer is, I'm going to get tipsy with my husband while we watch Carmen San Diego reruns. <laughs> Wow, that is so specific. Yeah. And while I shout at the children for doing their best but getting the countries wrong, I don't know. But it's also me shouting answers that are not correct. So it isn't was a, it also it was a I'm just putting together now, isn't yeah. that show the game basically just clue? Like they have to figure out three things, right? Uh, well, I mean, the first part they have to answer like trivia, and oh, then the, that's right. the second one they have to like pick where she where people could be on the board, and then the winner gets to run around on a really big mat with that huge pole with the light on the top that they have right. to put it down on the uh, countries. And right. no, nobody, nobody was winning because you have to get eight in forty five seconds, which that's I feel hard. is impossible. So I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> And so I'm, I realized I was running late and I was like, oh, I got to go get stuff set up. And so my husband finished off the episode and I was running around. I come back in the room and then he just like, without saying a word, just picks up the remote and slowly presses play. And I look and there's like so many seconds left and this girl has six. And I was like, did he do this back so that I could see this girl win? And I was like, is she going to win? He goes, oh, I don't know like he didn't know and sure enough she won and i was like it's impossible and i was yeah she's going to colorado so good for her yeah. different altitude though i got sick every time i went different <laughs> they're, altitude they're only allowed uh, to pick north america colorado huh i mean no offense to colorado it's, again it's yeah. gorgeous i just that's interesting that that was her, her choice yeah. i remember very well from watching that show some of the some of the like the moments, so when they're playing the main game or what I would consider to be the main game, sure. they're trying to find the different things. It was like, the warrant. I remember that. And I remember- Rockapella, yeah. Jake the snake. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. There was an yeah. acapella group. That's right. Oh, man. Yeah. I want to ask, and listen, no judgment. I, I'm just curious, like, what um, <laughs> inspired that as a choice of viewing? Um... Well, we did, uh, I mean, I guess this gives away, I guess it doesn't matter. They can know what day we record things. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, we posted a fan fave Friday talking about 90s TV shows. And one of them, one of my personal favorites from my childhood was Carmen Sandiego. And I got to talking about it with my husband and I made the comment about like, God, what I would love to rewatch some of that because I lived for it and it was everything I remembered and more and that rockapella just I mean they serve their purpose I guess I, I my quote was they're ahead of their time <laughs> oh wow yeah I, I mean I don't know I mean, I'd pitch say perfect that. pitch perfect did make acapella music cool so it's the only reason I said that they had anything going for them at the time yeah well listen I, I love it now, if anyone listening to this podcast was a contestant on Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, or if you are a member of Rockapella, please email <laughs> us, theories at truecrimecocktails.com. We'd love to hear about your experience on the show. Oh, my uh, God. Especially if you're the bass guy, because my favorite is the bow. 
like oh, yeah, yeah. my favorite is that guy. <laughs> Just well, it's amazing. Speaking of base guys, uh, we have <laughs> a very exciting update for Beautiful. everyone. So if you listen to our last episode of the show, which of course was based on Hope Whispers, the Dateline mystery, uh, the mm-hmm. special episode we did, uh, Christy and I spoke about an experience we had in Toronto in the early 2000s uh, where there was mm-hmm. a, a band that we saw play. And the bass player from said band uh, was a gentleman uh, who went by Stone. And we had an interaction where basically, you know, we hung out with him and he was very interested in Christy, almost <laughs> as interested as he was in getting his hands on some codeine, which <laughs> felt like, again, such a b- bizarre specific. But we were talking yeah. and we were, I was talking about like, look, you know, you're a researcher. Can we find out if, if Stone is still alive, if he's still playing music, et cetera. And the, the point is, is Christy has an update. So this is like Unsolved Mysteries update, right? Yeah. And what's yeah. the update? Well, this is me eating crow. (laughs) His legal name is Stone. (laughs) Oh my God, like Stone Phillips. Now I'm thinking more and more that Stone Phillips must be his given name. I could not find anywhere that it said his name wasn't Stone. Wow. Uh, The thing is, I took the CD. I found like, because I still have the CD, which when I opened it, I realized he had signed it for me. Um... And called me squiggle buns. But the best part is, is that, for, well, first of all, squiggle buns. Yeah. The best part is, is that he misspelled squiggle. So yes. it's squiggle buns. <laughs> which feels like a different, feels like a different well, thing. That's why you don't mess with Cody in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so you've located Stone. Stone is his given. I have. I have, yeah. What did you find out? Uh, he he was the bass player, because we went back and forth. Was he bass or guitar? You right. were right. He was a bass player. He okay. played for that band from January of 2000 to December 2004. So we oh, caught wow. him right in a sweet spot in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, he graduated high school in 1989. <laughs> Bowser. Okay, so, so, he, so was, he was a little bit older than us, which is important to note again because he was hardcore hitting on Christy like big time. Yes, I mean yeah. to be fair, I was legal age sure, at the time, but there and to, been... again to be fair, nothing happened. But I mean, it's for the best that nothing happened. But I'm like looking back at this, I'm like, ah, oh, I can't believe I denied him this little ginger snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, you know what? Absolutely. It was his loss. It was totally his loss. Look, I know it's hard to tell now, but when I was like 1920, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> like, I, I had red hair, obviously, my whole life, and I hated it as a child. Hated it. There were so few redheads, and we would get teased for having red hair because it was just like a ridiculous, like, okay, clown. Um... And so I wanted to dye my hair black, but my mother would never let me. And then I hit 19 and suddenly red hair became like, how you doing? (laughs) And uh, I never wanted to dye my hair after that. Well, I'll tell you again, I've referenced it many times on this podcast and yes, yes, I have witnessed it in person. It is, it is a, it's an amazing thing to watch. Um, But first of all, how dare you say that you, I'm sure you can't tell now because listen, you still got it going and whether you want to admit it or not, it's true. You are too kind. I listen, I speak the truth. So, okay. So he graduated high school and did you say 1989? I did. I did. So he was probably about, he was like 11 years older than you around. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this man in his thirties was hard hitting on a girl who had basically just turned 20. Okay. Good to know. Keep yep. moving. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a bass player and songwriter for multiple bands. Okay. He's currently a bass player for a band. Do I mention his band? I don't know. Do we want people to know who he is? I mean, if people did a deep dive like you did, I think they could probably find him. They could probably find him. You know what? I'm just going to skip it over. They're, unless they send me a hat, I'm not saying their name. Okay, sure. I don't <laughs> want a hat. Um, he's a co-host of a radio show. Oh. Uh, he's married. He has kids. He appears to be relatively sober. Good. Um, 
And uh, he has, tr- they have traveled a lot as a family in the sure. last few months. Like, wow, okay. Universal Studios, Disneyland, all of that. But I'm going to say this always in a mask. Mm. He's not the, t- I never thought he would be in a mask. Um, but good for him. Good for his family. Sure. Uh, I was looking through photos and I was like, oh, I don't know if that's him for sure. And then I saw one photo of him holding the base and the way he was holding it and the way his hands were positioned. I was like, boom, I was de- back at the hard rock in that concert. I was like, I could see it. I was like, that, those are his hands. And I was like, why do I remember what his hands look like? Well, he remembered what your buns look like. <laughs> <laughs> Very squiggle. <laughs> squiggle buns. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay. This is yeah. impressive. So this is a fair amount of information. So yeah. I, you know what? I, and I want to say, I feel bad because in the last episode, I was like, who knows what he's doing it's nice to hear that he seems to be living a very good life and that he is still playing music i think that's great and there does not appear to be any legal issues that i could find so well i mean at least he was you know as as far as we knew he was only dipping into the legal drugs i.e the codeine so that's good and and maybe he did have a bad back sure sure it's just an interesting choice but totally Again, he was just looking for a relief, and this painkiller said no. <laughs> this painkiller. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. Oh, boy. It's going to be. <laughs> that's what you're in store for in the next hour. Well, listen, uh, first of all, we never only go an hour. Second I know. Of all, I know. Second of all, it brings me to a question, which is what you drinking? What's in that cup? Well, I don't know if you specifically came up with the concoction or if it's something we came up with at one point during a trip, but it's uh, some vodka because mama likes her vodka. Of course. Um, Some Fresca, Mm -hmm. a little cran cherry juice. Oh. Half a lime. And? It's, it's delicious. How, how much does it taste like a Palm Bay? Um, not close. And I say okay. that because I started with a Palm Bay. <laughs> Listen, I love that, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> the a, a one- Palm Bay during Carmen San Diego. Of course. Everybody does it. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I worked a little bit late tonight, which is why we are, uh, we, we were behind. So what I like is that, that get, that's giving you the chance to get onto your second drink, which I think is very good. Yeah. Um, I am into the, again, the, the lime high noons. I didn't have a chance to go shopping this week. I've had a bit of a bear of a week. Um, so what's nice about that is, is I've got this one. I got three right here, chilling in the ice bucket right here. So that's buckle so in listeners. Cause this is going to be, <laughs> this one might get sloppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They could probably sorry. count on it. We're sorry. And you're welcome is the point. Um, Now, listen, we were talking, of course, about Stone, about this whole thing, because after last week's episode, that's when you reminded me about Squigile Buns, which we had (laughs) forgotten to mention, and I'm so glad we got it in there. Um, But it also reminded me, and this this is, again, on theme of what we've been talking about, we went to a boxcar racer concert on that same trip. Yeah. And Boxcar Racer, for those who don't know, was it was Tom and Travis from Blink-182, right? Mark wasn't in this I one. I think so, right. Yeah. So they were, Blink-182, if you're a fan or, or if you're not, uh, you know, they, they've been in a bunch of different bands. Like, they all kind of, like, shuffle around. And this was this latest incarnation. And so we decided to go. The Used was opening for them, which is the first time we experienced The Used, which we both became big fans of that band. Oh, yeah. I accosted Burt McCracken. This is before that they were famous. And I, yeah, yeah, I really, I really went for it anyway. um, So we're in the crowd. And of course, because Christy is a beacon, like I can't stress this enough. Like anywhere we go, it's just, they're they're like moths to a flame. And this guy started talking to me and somehow it came out that his name was Mike and he was from Buffalo, (laughs) which Buffalo isn't that. It's, it's, Oh, so sorry. My fucking microphone. Okay. We got to pause. I'm so sorry. Nope. It's okay. All right. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so we're in the crowd and we meet somebody. Long story short, he informs us his name is Mike and he is from Buffalo. (laughs) I don't know how that came up, but it also should be noted that Buffalo isn't super far from Toronto, 
but it's a bit of a drive for somebody wanting to go to a concert. I mean, I feel like it would probably be a couple of hours. Um, but listen, Mike from Buffalo was there and he was not interested in that band. He was interested <laughs> in a very young Christy Oxborough. And I don't remember very much. I just, I just remember his like intense interest in you and yeah. that I think you gave him my landline number. Do you remember that? I'm, if I did, I wouldn't have done it without your permission. Right. No, no. I think you have my permission, but, but I do feel like you gave him that number. That seems right. <laughs> I remember he was blonde. He was blonde. That's yeah. about as much as I remember. But I like, I mean, the fact that this and Stone and the guy driving over multiple lanes of traffic to come mm -hmm. over and talk to me. The fact that that all happened in one trip and I'm coming from a small town and going to this larger town, like as a woman, <laughs> that was probably the, bit, the best trip uh, on record, you know? Listen, I mean, you, yeah, well. you were like, you were the bowling pin and or you were the bowling ball and they were just the pins you were knocking down. Um, yeah. I think that we did give him the number because if I remember correctly, at some point in the days that followed, there was a voicemail on my, on my phone. And I believe it was like, hi, it's Mike from Buffalo. Look at yeah. <laughs> I feel like he like, that yeah. was how he would introduce himself. And then we started doing this bit where it's like, Hey, Christy, Mike from Buffalo's on the line. <laughs> Want to take this call? The, and the, the bit, the full bit was us like doing a radio show. That's right. Because it was like, and we've got Mike from Buffalo on the line. <laughs> I mean, again, the amount of times we basically played this, like yeah. played podcasts before we knew what podcasts were. And yeah. that's what's really amazing about it. Again, when we start to think about all <laughs> yeah. of the times that we basically were doing interview shows and talk shows, uh, you know, it was all like very bizarre foreshadowing. If this was a Charles Dickens novel, you know, <laughs> It, we, we, it would, by now, the reader would be like, get them on the podcast. We <laughs> foreshadowed this forever. Yeah. For yeah. Uh, anyway, long story short, too late. My point is, if you are Mike from Buffalo, <laughs> if that was you and you remember this, <laughs> uh, Stone, if you're listening, who knows? We got squiggle buns here and we'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So email us. <laughs> at True Crime love to reconnect. Yeah. We'd love to reconnect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, about that trip. Uh, we mentioned this last time that we went and saw Eight Mile. Yes. Um, I was looking up dates because I wanted to confirm that we had the right, that we'd given the right information. And uh, th that concert would have been November 7th. Okay. Eight Mile released theatrically November 8th. <laughs> it's feasible we were there opening night. We went and saw it twice. We napped before a 10, I think a 10 or 11 p.m. show. Yep. And my favorite thing, it's honestly my favorite experience I've ever had in a theater, ever, um, and probably will never be topped, was, um, for those of you familiar with 8 Mile, and I hope it's a lot of you because- Me too. Me I was too. obsessed with that movie because I was in love with Eminem at the time because Blanche. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's just owning it now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh. And we went and saw it. We're sitting there. They have their rap battle. And people got to their feet to applaud. Yep. And I was so in shock. I just didn't know what was happening. I was like, you know, this is a movie, right? And not we're the not best at one, a right? Rap battle. We're not at a rap battle. Like, yeah. 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 Like they were, they were treating it like it was live. And it was the most amazing experience <laughs> I've ever had. It was what fantastic. I like is that you know you know you the small town gal come yeah. to the big city in Toronto get hit on by countless men and then watch people have a very theatrical experience in a movie theater. Yeah. I really threw you in the deep end on that trip. You did. It was great. That also was probably the one the trip where we were supposed to blow up the air mattress before we went out, but we're like, ah, we'll do it when we get back. But we were so hammered when we got back yeah. that we couldn't blow it up. So I just, <laughs> I just slept on the like flat air mattress. And I know what you're all thinking, like Lauren, why didn't you let her sleep in the bed with you? The answer is I had a twin bed. I had a tiny bed. Now yeah. in retrospect, I should have given you the bed. 
So that's on oh, me. Oh, no. That's on me. No. I, it, the fact that we like, I crawled in and just <laughs> laid down. <laughs> oh, God. Nobody's standing up and applauding that. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should have. And I'm remiss. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't reminisce about this. Um, again, I'm still working that's, on that. Look. If they're if salt and pepper is looking about getting together again, yeah, maybe they need to add a scotch of cinnamon. <laughs> well, careful, or I'm gonna add I, you, ginger. You know what I mean? Come on, I listen. don't know what's happening. We're a whole over spice here. rack, we're a spice rack, which yeah, I love. Yeah, oh, shoot. Well, listen, let's get into the episode. Of course, in this episode, oh. we're going to be talking about the unsolved mysteries episode, Stolen Kids. Stolen Kids is the episode. Just a real bright, <laughs> oh boy, a real a real pick me up, a real pick me up. Yeah. But um, wow, I gotta say, watching these new ones because this was the last of the new ones. Yes. And I, you know, we were so excited, obviously, that we had started this podcast, and there was a new set of them coming out, and that was so much fun. And and you know, we binged them in one day so that we could figure out what we wanted to talk about, et cetera, first. And, and I, I mean, I mean, if dear listeners, you think it's a coincidence that we've left this one till last, uh, (laughs) I think it's safe to say there's a reason, um, which is, it was a hard watch. I I personally found that one very difficult to watch. I don't know about you. Yeah. As a mother. (laughs) Here we go. Here we go. uh, I mean, Oh my God. I mean, I would like to think as a human, it was just difficult to watch. Yeah. But watching those mothers talk about just like that split second where their kid is there and then they're gone. And the fact that they've spent the last like 30 years sick about it. Um, So uh, full, full disclosure, I have been dreading this moment and this yeah. week and mostly like obviously never dreading uh the moment that we do this because it's great uh dreading the moment i had to research it was yeah. my thing like the second the episode started i was like okay oh no okay okay and instantly i'm like how can i nope i'm gonna spend a week looking through missing kids stuff and reading about terrible things with children and I'm like that's it's it's been a dark week and I think that's probably why I was like you know what I need a little classic Carmen and I need I need a cocktail and listen I think that's the the remedy to solve almost any ailment um but listen I do have to say though I think it's important that these stories get told I think it was important that you know Netflix and Unsolved Mysteries included it. Um, and I think it's great. I thought it was a good episode. It was just, it was just so heartbreaking to watch. But, yeah. you know, again, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, I'm sure you found some information for us. And we'll also get into, you know, um, the fact that, you know, what I think is great is that these people don't give up hope. Because it sounds crazy, but, you know, yeah. stranger things have happened. Um, you know, sometimes later in life, you know, these, these kids who then become adults are found. So anyway, let's get into it. Basically, for those of you who haven't watched the episode, uh, again, <laughs> trigger warning, um, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> kidnappings. Um, so basically what happened was in May of 1989, two-year-old Christopher Dansby went missing from a playground in Harlem. Three months later, Shane Walker disappeared while playing in that very same park. Both children are still missing to this day. Are these two cases connected? And what happened to Shane and Christopher? So basically, you know, that's, that's really the rundown of the episode. There isn't yeah. a lot of beats. And we'll, we'll, we'll touch on, um, you know, the other things that were, were talked about. But that's really kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what happened. And it's obviously just such a sad, tragic, awful story. Um, but I guess it begins May 18th of that year, May 18th, 1989. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, of course, first of all, we're going to talk about Christopher Dansby, which was the first of these two children to go missing. And his mom, Allison. Yes. Right. Um, she talks about how she had got, was going to a store, left Christopher with her mother, and then explain what exactly happened. Uh, well, she had taken Christopher to the playground that's outside the uh, apartment buildings that they were living in. Um, And she said she always goes and gets him a little treat from the store for when they're done at the park. 
So her mom was at the park watching him. She went to the store. She said she was gone maybe 30 minutes tops. And she came back and she couldn't see him. So she went to her mother and she's like, hey, where's Christopher? And her mother was like, oh, he's just over there. And well, he wasn't. So it ends up with her running around the whole playground, can't find him, like running everywhere. And I mean, the place they lived um, was called Martin Luther King Towers. And it was this area that had 10 buildings in it and 1,373 apartments. Wow. So when police came to help look for him and like start canvassing apartments, like trying to do that in a timely manner is not going to help because right. we know like once a kid is missing, you've got to get on finding them immediately. Yeah. Um, the search block for him was 24 or the search radius was 24 blocks. Um, and this apartment playground that they were at was about three blocks north of uh, the north end of Central Park. Okay. And like Central Park is two and a half miles long, half a mile wide. It's got like woods to it. It's got lawns. It's got seven different bodies of water throughout it so it's like once you get so far like they had they brought in tracking dogs to follow his scent it got as far as the edge of the park and then went couldn't find him anymore so who knows he could have been in a vehicle he could have gone right further into the park we don't know they did search um as best they could throughout the park and all of that but i mean spoiler not only is this episode depressing I didn't find them. <laughs> and and how can I really? Like yes. I'm yes. not going to be able to find the end of this story which is unfortunate, but I do like and bless the hearts of those mothers for keeping that hope. Yeah. I would like to think I would be the same, but it's just like how does that not destroy you, you know? So I just now, I had a question. Oh, I don't know if yeah. you know the answer to this, but Allison obviously, again, had left Christopher with her mother. Yeah. And the mother was was interviewed in the episode as well, I believe, wasn't she? I don't think so. I thought she was. Uh, Maybe one I'm of wrong. her sisters was, I thought. No? I thought it was a sister of hers. Was that her mother? Because if that was her mother, she looks I great. Think her mother, I think it was her mother. I think she's very young. Oh, um, wow. Good for her. I also love that this is the first time I've ever stumped you. Like, again, this is really a testament <laughs> yeah. to how disturbing we found this episode. Um, but I, I guess my bigger question is, how does that affect your relationship with your mother? Not that, obviously, I'm sure it was, you know... I mean, do you have an answer about that? Or was that face just about like, oh, boy? Um, I can tell you this. If I was in... Allison's position. Yeah. Sure. I would be like, you know what? This, this happens. It could have happened on my watch. Right. And I'm going to say, I don't blame her, but I'm, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm never going to be able to look at her the same way again is kind oh. of how I think it would go. Like I would spend yeah. my life being really super super angry at her for being like why did you look away in that moment why weren't you looking closer and who knows she could have maybe looked away for like a split second right because that's all yeah. it takes and the thing is no matter how angry she is you know that this woman is never no one's going to be more angry at this woman than this woman probably is and it probably like eats her up that yeah she was any part of it so yeah oh and yeah. i mean it's not her fault i don't blame her in any way because whatever happened to him wasn't her right so i yeah. just i mean it's a it's a shitty situation it really and is. i'm sure it did not help any relationship that they would have had yeah um no that's a good point so what were the other details? I mean, I feel like all I remember was that the police kind of did do a search, but then it's questionable, like, how hard did they search? How well did they search? Again, I don't know if there was any sort of racial bias. This was 1989. It was obviously a predominantly black area at that time. You know, I, that was kind of my concern as I was watching this was like, are they really trying? Um, you know, are they I really, mean, are they exhausting everything? Sure. 
Great question. Um, I mean, they did get, they had helicopters out. They did canvas um, all of these buildings. They uh, went through the lake. They took divers to the lake that was the closest right uh, inside of Central Park there. Um, the dogs that led them to that street. But it's like, I'm, I don't know how much there would be like cameras in and around that area at that right. point. So I'm guessing it's like a once the, once the dogs don't have a trail, then they're like, well, I don't know what to do. So I think, right. I don't know if they necessarily like didn't try enough. I think it was just like a, well, what are our options really? Right. Because New York is massive. It is. It definitely is. Even just like that small area he was in is just like anybody could just go missing. I'm actually like, I looked into like if any other kids had gone missing from this particular uh, set of buildings, because this building is like, it's like almost like a three block square, more like almost, I guess, more of a rectangle but it's like a huge thing and then these 10 massive buildings that are like 14 floors high each and like there's trees everywhere and so it's like it could so somebody could get so easily lost in there right i'm shocked that more children hadn't gone missing from that area and especially being so close to central park and then yeah. like a few blocks the other way there's uh a river whose name I can't think of. I don't know. It's near Manhattan or something. Again, I New York is not my thing. I don't really get it. But <laughs> as a concept, you don't really get New York. Well, I mean, I get it, but I mean, I have seen a miracle on Thirty Fourth Street <laughs> well, several times. Well, <laughs> Both versions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying, I, uh, I've, I mean, keep in mind, I go to Toronto and I'm like, oh, this is huge and I'm yeah. overwhelmed. So I can't imagine how I would feel in New York. God, I'd fucking clean up there. <laughs> you would. You really would. Oh. Also, I just want to point out that when you have come to visit me here in LA, when we get on the freeways, she has been known to close her eyes because she's like, it's terrifying. <laughs> Which I get. It is terrifying on these freeways. Yeah. But it is adorable. Yeah. I will. I mean, I get, I have gotten more and more nervous and more and more anxious about everything uh, the further into my life I get. Right. You know? Thank you for so. using the term further into my life and not older, because I think that that's honoring, that's honoring the journey that we're on. Which I, I, like. I don't know what's going on, but I'm like, I'm feeling it today and I'm just in a weird mood and there's, I've complimented myself multiple times tonight already, which is unheard of. So I'm, I'm, I'm just here for feeling it. it. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Who wouldn't want this bitch? <laughs> again, again, this takes me back to the um, death row fugitive where there was so much tension. Yeah because of the episode and like the heaviness of it. Because like, we were talking about a child murder. Yes. Yeah. And we were like, how yeah. are we going to, how are we going to handle that? And how's it going to go? And our brains just shut off. <laughs> and, and pajama pants bailiff was born, yep. you yep. know? Absolutely. Well, one may say she was born early eighties, but that's, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But I feel like it's the same kind of energy where it's just like, it's tense because you're like, this is missing children and it's devastating. And I, I spent the episode because as you know, I rewatch, so I yes, had to course. watch it again. Oh, no. And uh, I just wanted to know, did any of those producers hold that woman? Because like the one did fairly well, like trying to keep herself together. And the other one, you could just see her falling apart. And I was like, somebody hold her. Yeah. Pause the recording. Hold her. Like yeah. even show. I want to see someone showing me their human side. Get in there. Hold her because yeah. she needed it. She Don't did. just stand there and film her tears. Get in there. Be a human. That's an order. Be a human. And you know what? I just wanted to quickly double what... back. I wanted to double back just very quickly. Yeah. Because uh, talking about how we, our brains shut off because of whatever mm -hmm. and that it was like, yeah. oh, we went crazy. 
that connects us to another episode, which was which Friends cast member would we be? And that does make me feel like we're Chandler making jokes when we feel uncomfortable. So, oh my God. Put that into the mix. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I look forward to the day we start talking about what other cast members, like we got to start thinking what other shows, you know, so that mm-hmm. by the end of this, which is not for decades if I have my way. Thank you. But at the end of this, I can have like books because in my mind, it would be fun to make books out of it. (laughs) I just want books of like, these are, this is, this is the photo album of who I would be if I was all these different TV characters. Oh, I love that. I love that. I I think that would be fantastic. I thought you meant that you would spend like time transcribing all of our words from every episode. Uh, Well, that's a lofty goal. I don't hate (laughs) Oh my God, like, look, I love it. If there's a market for it. Yeah, look, if, if you listen, I mean, if, if people want to read, you know, pages and pages, <laughs> pages of dialogue, sure, that's fine. Why yeah. not? Look, hmm. look, if, if, if there was an interest and I did it, it would, it would be, it's been a dream of mine, as you know, to sell a book. And even oh, though that's not yes. really my book, Isn't it's it, close enough. It's close enough. Well, who doesn't um, want to read this bitch? Like the amount of t- <laughs> the amount of times I say that. What I know? like, what I would like, is if you turned it into like prose. So it, you wrote it oh. as though it's like, who wouldn't want this bitch? She said with a sly grin. You know what I mean? Like then you kind of made it like. Well, I guess it's bordering on fan fiction. Do I you want I'm me actually- to make our own fan fiction? <laughs> no, no. Because I can, yeah. but. Did I, do you remember when I used to write that chopped fan fiction? Yes. It was hot. Yes. Speaking about us complimenting ourselves, listen, dear listeners, There's not you can enough still of it. find it. You can still find my chopped fan fiction. I broke my foot one year. I was laid up. It was really a precursor to the pandemic, quarantine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, I got bored. So I got into online shopping. And then the other thing I got into was writing chopped fan fiction. And it got steamy. It got steamy. If you're not a fan of chopped, it is, of course, a cooking competition show on the Food Network and it's a whole, it's a barrel of laughs. I will say my, my sweet boyfriend, I was trying to get him to watch it and he was being very nice, but I could tell that maybe, mm. maybe he wasn't that into it. And I was- The but, basket's but one, not for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, he opens his basket, it's empty. Anyway, <laughs> I, um, yeah. so then I put it on. Let me tell you a little something. It took him about three minutes and he was hooked and I could not have been happier. He also recently revealed to me we watched Hamilton, his idea, because he'd never seen it. He didn't care for it. And I was like, but at the time, he told me that he liked it. And then I was like, it's very sweet that you were trying to save my feelings. But then also, like, you don't have to like Hamilton. You know? Like, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm setting you up. Oh, I know. I know. Because- I know. I've never seen it. Mm-hmm. I know. I Listen. know. I should. And I know that. But I'm also worried because is this going to be a plodden rap battles again? Like, I don't know how this. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing. Here's no, what I want to say. And I say this with love, but I do. And listen, I loved it. I loved the, the Disney plus film version, but I do think that it does. Like for me, part of it was like being there and experiencing it live. I do feel okay. like it kind of loses a little bit personally. Again, that's no shade to Hamilton. I love it so much. I also, this is not a name drop. I was at a, a an event in New York a couple of years ago and Lin-Manuel Miranda showed up randomly and, um, someone was like, oh, I'll introduce you. And I was like, don't do it. And they were like, no, no, come on. It's fine. I know him. And I was like, this is bad. And they walked over and and he was like, they're like, hey, Lynn, this is Lauren Ash. She's from Superstore. And he goes, oh, of course, you're great on that show. And I went, huh. And just stared, just stared at him. And then I was like, it's nice to meet you. What I wanted to say is your music changed my life. (laughs) What I wanted to say is I had an emotional reaction to everything you've written. Again, I, you know, I played it cool, but some sure. say maybe too cool by, by, you know, not speaking words. Um, sure. Like I will say, I may not be in, be familiar with uh, his work in Hamilton, but my youngest was obsessed with Moana. There you go. And that soundtrack, I never got tired of it. 
he didn't have to go that hard for us, but he did. He did. And I appreciate it. Absolutely. It was that that soundtrack is phenomenal. And I I will die on this mountain. <laughs> that's the to me, that's the best thing he's ever done. And that's huge to say for someone who's never seen the hugest <laughs> thing he's ever done. But to me, that's just old timey eight mile. <laughs> Oh my god. I love it so much. This it so much. Anyway, back to the stolen kids. Um <laughs> oh, oh god. Okay, so yep, the, co- yep. the cops look for Christopher again. Yeah. They it does sound like they did exhaust a lot of things, but again, this was 1989. We didn't necessarily have the same technology we have now, unfortunately. Right. So then I guess we're cutting forward to August 10th. Of the yes. same year, 1989. And yeah. again, it's a, it, the park is crowded once again, which I, that was something that stood out to me in the episode that I guess maybe it wasn't huge news. Like it, it surprised me that Christopher had been taken from the park yeah. and that months later it was still packed. You know, I guess for me, it would be like if I ever heard any sort of um, tale of a child being taken, I would definitely be like, we're not going to that one. But again, I don't know. Um, well, I just um, thought it was like, it, I guess part of me was like, was it kind of like, you know, kind of brushed aside in the news? Was that something that had gone on potentially? I don't know. Well, the mother of the second kid, um, Shane, in this August part, she made a comment of she had never heard about Christopher going missing. She'd never heard of Christopher. And she lived, obviously, like, again, there's almost 1,400 apartments, so they're not going to hear about everybody. But you would think, again, police were supposed to canvas everywhere. So you think she would have heard about it. If not personally, she would have heard from neighbors or anybody who lives in there, in that area that she knows of, that it's like, oh, my God, did you hear that this kid went missing? Right. That is interesting. So I'm guessing a lot of people just didn't know about it, and that's why... That's where they went. And they said it was also like really hot. Right. And who knows? I doubt there's air conditioning in most of those apartments. So. And apartments get hot, man. Yeah. So take the kids outside. The closest place you have is that playground. So. Yeah. yeah. So August 10th, 1989, Shane, his mother is Rosa. Yep. And it's a crowded day in the park once again. And then she said that two kids, a boy and a girl, approached Rosa to ask to play with Shane. Now, these kids, she said, were what? Like seven, eight, nine? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, Shane at this point was how old? Uh, 19 months. 19 months. So it's a little bit weird. Like, I get it. Like, I know that kids at, at, you know, eight, nine, ten, I think, really love little babies and and toddlers and stuff like that. So I can see there being that kind of interest. Like, oh, I want to play with that cute little kid. But she did say that she, she said no to these kids, right? Yeah, and that yeah. they they persisted and they just like wouldn't leave her alone about it. And it's like, sure, maybe they were like, it's a cute kid, I want to play with him. But it's like, but if the park was crowded, what are the odds of there being another kid you could have gone to play with? Right. So, I, I mean, that's a red flag to me that these kids purposely came over and just wouldn't leave her alone until she said, yeah, okay, you can play with him. Because I, 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 again, I am not blaming this mother. She has done nothing wrong. Of course. Um, I just, I don't think I would say, yes, my kid can go play with you because you're strangers to me. And he's so little that I would just be like, he, I'm not going to have him go with a stranger. Yeah. So I'm good. Uh, but he went with these kids. Right. And she looked away and she looks back and she can't see them anywhere. Then suddenly she sees these two kids again and she approaches them and she's like, well, where's Shane? And they're like, oh yeah, he went over there somewhere. And that was it. And suddenly Shane can't be found. Police have to be called. They still haven't found him. The police talked to these kids and it just seemed, they were just kids at the park and they knew nothing else. And it's like, I don't buy that for a second. No. I truly believe that somebody wanted these kids and in this case, they used other kids to go get them, to lure these kids out to a place, to a vehicle, to something because it's weird to have these kids push and push and as the mother being like, no, I don't, we're good and then just keep pushing them until you finally get the kid. 
there's just something not right about that. It you does know? feel not right. And it also feels like, you know, they talk about, you know, I remember, you know, street proofing when you're a little kid, they talk about like tactics that people will use. So for example, if you're say a 10 year old kid, it could be like, Hey, my dog's missing. Can you help me find him? Like that was always one that I remember being, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, but that's for an older child. If we're talking about a toddler here, we're talking about a 19 year, a 19 month old. It is, it does strike me as being an interesting tactic to get other kids of yours or, or whoever, um, to, to lure the child that does feel like it's a much easier play than of course, an adult trying to lure that child and, you know, from a parent, it does yeah. feel like it would be a, you know, a very dark, um, but arguably like brilliant in their nefarious Ooh, brilliance. It is, it is definitely the smarter move because mostly yeah. small children are going to be afraid of someone that's like taller or like an adult right. they don't know or something. So you get someone less, um, I can't even think of the word. You get somebody that's less intimidating, I guess. And what's more, inti what's less intimidating than like a child. Yeah. And to them, it's like a playmate. So who knows? But it's like the odds that, this, that these kids come over and then suddenly the kid's just never seen again. And the fact that they were really, really pushing to play with him where it's like, yeah. what are you going to get out of playing with this kid? You have no idea who this kid is. So it's just, yeah. it's weird to me. And I'm... I would like to see the footage of their interrogation. I know they didn't get interrogated. They just asked them a couple of questions. Yeah. But I'd be uh, turning and where that are their lamp parents? on. Yeah. Where are their parents in all of this? Who were their yeah, parents? I don't know. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of questions. Well, I know that you've located a similar case, but we're going to have to take a break first and then we're going to come back and I want to hear all about that. Is it connected to these cases? Is it not? Well, we're going to get into it. So go get yourself a drink, refill it, Hit the shitter. <laughs> and we'll be right back. Hit the shitter? <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, God. I have to pee so bad. It is, it is time for us to take a break, legit. But I also have to pee so bad. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. I'm going to hit record again. And recording again. You good? Oh, yeah. Welcome back, everyone, to True Crime and Cocktails Unsolved Mysteries Edition. We are discussing, of course, Stolen Kids, the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, uh, the, the final one of this new batch of Unsolved Mysteries episodes. So that's also exciting for us. Now, of course, we're talking about two children that went missing, and you found a similar case. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, by similar, I mean a boy who went missing in the same year, very, very young. Um, his name is Andre Bryant. Okay. He's still missing to this day as well, right. which is another thing. Um, this is in March of 1989. Uh, his mother, Monique, was about 25. She's walking with her three young children in Brooklyn. So it's like a little bit away from where they were in Harlem, but not that far. Um, I think it's like less than 12 miles away. Um, and so his mother's walking with her three kids. She's approached by two women. These women, they start talking. One of them asks if she can hold Andre, who is about a month old at this point. Um, then they convince that Monique and her children should just go shopping with them. So she goes shopping with them. They buy her an outfit she goes home that night and tells her husband, like, they bought me these clothes. Uh, I think they used a stolen credit card. I'm going shopping again with them tomorrow. So the next day, uh, Monique is supposed to go with these women and the women call and they're like, make sure you bring Andre with you because we really want to go. We really want to hang out with him and with you and whatever. And so she's like, great. So she has her mother, I believe, hang out and babysit her uh, older children. And she takes this one-month-old baby with her. And the last time Monique or Andre is seen is getting into this vehicle with these women at 2 p.m. Uh, the next morning, Monique's body is found in uh, woods near, Brook near the Bronx, uh, about 20 miles away. Um, she'd been struck in the head and then strangled. And Andre has never been found since. 
Wow. Um, so when you go on like a missing kids website, they do have this case linked to Shane and Christopher because, I mean, they were very young children. They were boys. They were, all three were African-American. So it's like, maybe, who knows? Like the fact that they all went missing within months of each other in 1989 is crazy. Um, I don't believe this one is probably the same people in any way. I mean, yes, they were all boys and all of that, but Andre was, it was such violent, it was so violent compared to the other two. The other two, they just like snuck in and ninja those kids out, right? Like yeah. it was so quiet, no one noticed a thing. Or if they noticed, they didn't say. Whereas this, they pushed and pushed until they like killed her. Which well, the I'm- only the only thing I would offer to that, I hear yeah. you, absolutely. And listen, I, I may be getting ahead of myself here. Um, but if this was a situation even if, if, whether it was that they were maybe wanting to, to take this baby as one of their own, or if it was, you know, taking this baby to, to sell to a family, like, a, like an underground adoption situation, mm-hmm. I would guess that the younger the baby, the, the more money you would probably get because if someone's True. adopting a child. So is it, you know, is it enough money to kill for? I mean, that's, I mean, that's a... <laughs> That's an objective, que- uh, subjective sure. question. Um, but it, it does, it does strike me that he was, again, so young that he was only oh, a month yeah. old, and that it did kind of end in this grisly way. I mean, it's 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 got to be difficult unless you're frequenting or working in a hospital. It's got to probably be difficult to take a infant of that young an age is all I'm saying. So I, I oh, guess yeah. for me. <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a hard to come by, you know, um, age, I would think, um, which again is all of this is just so horrifying to talk about. It's, it's yep. making, making my stomach turn, to be honest with you. Um, it's why we turn it. into uh, Miss Chenandler Bong. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> because when we're, uncom- right. when we're uncomfortable, we go with the jokes and... And you know what else we do? The clown rolls in. Nice. That's what else we do. <laughs> Again, the fact that that's uh, not that's not our uh, specific Law and Order. Dun dun. You know, <laughs> that's like, the sound of a can. Yeah, that feels or champagne like, cork popping. Oh, I would like that. That would be nice. I also love that. I didn't think about it until earlier when my phone went off with a text. But my text tone has been the Law and Order dun dun for like the last eight years. Yep. So, yeah, you'd think I'd be sick of it by now, but I'm not. I'm Again, really not. Charles Dickens, if he wrote this story, people would be like, we get it. This is meant to be. It's <gasps> fate. He also would have written in Ghosts. <gasps> oh, my God. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. We're, we're, living, we're living fucking Dickens. We really are. God, I should have read a single one of his books. Well, listen, the chapter about you in your 20s is going to be called Great Sexpectations. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she knew what she had and how to use it. <laughs> yep, <she did. laughs> Absolutely. Meanwhile, I'm just like Miss Havisham, just sitting off to the side in a dirty old wedding gown. <laughs> Look, I think I've transitioned into that. Listen, it's a good place to be. It's a good place to be. Other than, you she know, the joltedness. Happy. Yeah, she seemed happy overall. Sure. <laughs> you haven't read that book, have you? Nope. No, I really yep. haven't. <laughs> yep. Not happy. Not a happy lady. Okay, anyway. okay. It was, I took a stab. It you did. You did. Work out. Well, it didn't work listen, out. I like it. All right. So, yeah. okay. So, you know, are those cases connect, connected, Christopher, Shane, and Andre? It's hard to say, but, you know, I've kind of tapped, tapped on it. I've kind of... I've kind of tiptoed around it. Now, I my question for you is, do you yeah. know anything about the potential of some sort of black market adoption ring? You know, was that something that, that existed at that time? I mean, it's also possible that it could have and we would never know, but I'm curious sure. if, if you knew anything about that. Um, well, I want you to hold on to your hat because I know a fuckload. Wow! <laughs> Again, wow. I apologize. Occasionally, like an occasional f bomb or a curse, sure. But what is this sailor I've brought with me today? Ahoy, matey! 
<laughs> I, uh, I'm out of control. I love it. Um, so, I mean, yes, is, is, are the three connected specifically? Who knows? I feel like the two, Christopher and Shane, absolutely are. Uh, mainly because they're the same. They were taken from the same playground. But also something that caught my eye watching the episode and didn't sit well with me. They were both taken on a Thursday. Oh, isn't that weirdly specific? Like, what are yes. the odds? It was it was hot and crowded, and it just so happened to be a Thursday both of those days. You can't tell me it was like somebody's day off or that was their day being in that area or however that works. I'm also completely convinced it has something to do with a black market adoption ring. Um, there are two, I mean, I, there are, I'm sure a lot and I can't really think about it, but we'd also don't have the time to go into like probably right disgusting amount that there are, but there are two in particular that I found that are of note. Um, one being child Haven of Northeastern Pennsylvania. So this started in 1984. It was founded by Lawrence and Harriet Lauer, uh, with the help of their lawyer, and Rabbi <laughs> Seymour Fenichel, Fenichel, something like that. Okay. We're just going to call him Seymour so it's less painful for me. Yeah. So they would lure pregnant women who were willing to potentially sell their babies. They'd meet with them in parking lots or like an elevator at a hospital Oh my God. To take the baby. They put ads in newspapers looking for pregnant women. They often intimidated women into giving up their babies. Um, their, they kind of, their reach was about 21 states and even into parts of Canada. Um, their operate, over their operation, they handled about 20 to 40 adoptions a year. Wow, that seems high. It does, yeah. Uh, the mothers were paid about $2,000. Uh, some claim that they were given more. Some couples paid up to $36,000 for a child. And keep in mind, that is 1984 money. That's not wow. now. Um, some couples paid up to $16,000 only to be told that the birth mother miscarried or changed changed her mind and sorry you're not getting a kid and sorry you're not getting your money back so really these people were just like anything to scam people out of money wow uh, they ended up being shut down in 1988 the police found out about them because a set of parents that paid money and got nothing complained which that is gotta take balls to be like by the way i was trying to illegally purchase a child right and they screwed me out of my, like, I'm willing to go to the police and be like, hey, get these guys. Well, it worked and they got shut down. So these three plus Seymour's daughter were indicted on 144 counts of child trafficking, falsifying birth records, grand larceny, conspiracy, fraud, perjury, and making false statements. Here's where it gets real fun. Oh, God. They avoided trial by pleading guilty. Oh. They took a plea deal that allowed them no jail time. <laughs> For all of those crimes, wow. Uh, Seymour, who was the rabbi slash lawyer, which is a show I would watch the hell out of, but that's not the point. Yep. Can I be his bailiff? Nope, nope. <laughs> let's, let's keep on track, Christy. Um, he was sentenced to five years probation and 2,000 hours of community service in 1990, and then he died in 1994. So oh, wow. he never really, uh, none of them really had any sort of, uh, there was no comeuppance, you know, right. like there was nothing, and it's really kind of frustrating. Yeah. Um, in 2010, a Facebook group was started in an attempt to locate all of the children involved to try and help them to find their birth parents. Um, one such girl, um, her, like, I found that this particular place was started in 1984, but apparently they had been starting working. They, they were like dipping their toe in the uh, steal a child and sell it to somebody else kind of waters earlier because in 1977, 
Uh, this woman gave birth to a baby. Uh, they, she was only 18 at the time. She was terrified. She wasn't married. She didn't know what she was going to do with her life. So they convinced her, we're going to take your baby. We're going to give you money. You'll be fine. Well, this child has grown up uh, to be a woman named Sarah. These, she ended up getting in contact with her birth mother, who ended up actually staying with this girl's biological father. So, and they have four other daughters. So this girl who grew up, grew up an only child now suddenly has four sisters. And she said there isn't even need for a DNA test, which I'm sure they did anyway. But she said, they look just like me. She's like, it's wow. the first time in my whole life I've ever seen anybody like me. And this is from like 1977 and they didn't meet till like the 2010s. Wow. So they were apart for that long and then they found her. That's so, wild. I mean, again, there's that tiny glimmer of hope, right? Yeah, so I you feel never like know. This is like the, I mean, obviously there are a lot of stories that don't end this way, but the fact that there are some at all yeah. That's got to say something, right? Absolutely. And listen, it's such a unfortunate scenario and, and chain of events and all of the above. And I'm sure it's a very kind of nuanced uh, situation for that family. But yeah, wow, that must be a truly unbelievable uh, discovery, especially at that point in your life, which is great. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was the first one you said you had, you had found. Yes. You said there was another one. Yeah. Well, Buckle up, True Crew, because this one is the worst. Oh no! I, I'm sure there's worse ones, but I can't. Sure, I can't no, think no. about it. I, and I think, listen, we're yeah. providing you know a good amount of information, and then we can you know just not not provide provide more. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I'm just gonna preface this with saying, uh, if I'm gonna call this woman who ran this particular one a bitch. I'm not saying it in the fun way where I'm like, this bitch. Like, that's like fun and playful and I'm saying it about myself and that's fine. Um, when I'm calling her a bitch, it's in the negative way. Got it. Uh, because this woman was a horrifying human being. Oh, no. So there's this, uh, there was, well, we'll get into the name of it later. Uh, so there's this woman named Georgia Tan. She wanted to be a judge like her father but her father forbade it. Uh, so she went into social work because it was one of the few socially acceptable positions for a woman of her esteemed background. So she went to work in Mississippi, but was fired for inappropriately removing children from impoverished homes without cause. Oh, God. So now this is like, this is also going way the fuck back. So in 1929... She started the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Essentially, it was an elaborate network of people like corrupt social workers, police officers, doctors, lawyers, and judges who kidnapped children to sell to wealthy adoptive parents for a steep profit. She targeted rich and famous people like actors, authors, entertainers, governors. Oh, um, most notably... Dick Powell, who apparently was a singer, actor in, the, uh, in that time. But the names that caught my eye, Lana Turner. And in 1947, Joan Crawford adopted <gasps> her twins from this woman. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this Georgia bitch... Uh, oh, yeah, I guess it sounds the same whether I'm being playful or mean, but either way. <laughs> either way. Ah! Um, her favorite way of getting children was she had a really, really fancy car. So she would drive through like the really impoverished neighborhoods and pick out what she called the prettiest children and then offer them a ride in her really shiny black luxury car. And then once they got in the car, they never went home. Um, she would, all, they would also kidnap children. And when I say they, I'm talking like these social workers, police officers, doctors, all of these people, they would kidnap them from preschools and churches and playgrounds. Um, they especially liked to go after the poor children because they knew their families didn't have the means to fight them. Um, she also liked that 
to have co-conspirators who were authority figures because people felt like they couldn't contradict them. Like who's going to believe you over a cop kind of a thing. Right. Um, And sometimes they would coerce mothers into signing their children away while the mothers were still partially sedated from the surgeries of, you know, from C-sections. Oh my God. Uh, She placed ads in newspapers with titles, like with a picture of children. And it would say, they'd like to be your Christmas gift. Or Nancy, just 11 months old, needs a home. Can you say no? Like, yeah. Oh my God. Um, It was shut down in 1949 after running for 21 years. It's believed that she made, in today's money, like $11 million. Oh, and my God. she was taking like 90% of this profit for herself. So one of the worst parts, she was never held accountable. Um, three days after the news of the scam was made public, she died. <laughs> she had an untreated... Uh, ur- untreated uterine cancer and she slipped into a coma and died so she never had anything come of it but she went all over the place stole these children sold them to people um at one point she had like a christmas raffle she created a baby catalog essentially um in the 1940s And then she did a Christmas baby giveaway in the newspaper where you could buy for $25 a ticket that would go into this raffle. And she raffled off 20 to 30 babies at this Christmas thing every year. And it was like a huge hit because so many people wanted uh, babies and they didn't really care how they got them. And then she would also go even further and be like, you know what? Terrible news. The parents of that baby, they actually want the baby back. But you know what? If you pay this steep legal fee, we'll make it go away. So, like, this woman was awful. This woman is a demon. Like, that's not human. It also just, I can't even really think about the fact that she never had anything come of it, right? Yeah. Um, So, one of the children in this situation... Um, there was a NASCAR driver uh, named Jean Tapia. Him and his wife, Francine, had a baby in September of 1942. Well, the, this Georgia woman and her people kidnapped this baby from the hospital. So they never even got to see the baby. It was like baby whisked away from them. We need to do some tests. We're going to check on the baby. They don't think anything of it. And the baby is gone. 47 years later, in 1990, they finally got to meet their son. Wow. They actually got to go face to face with him. Um, I'm not 100% on details of how they found him, but it all came out once this woman uh, admitted everything that she'd done and people knew what was going on. And so people just started like realizing we got to like, look for these children. We got to look for these parents. And somehow they got put in touch with each other and obviously did tests to make sure that he was their son. And he, they met him, their son for the first time when he was 47 years old. Wow. Which is devastating. But at the same time, like, I can't even imagine like, yeah. Who, who knew that they would ever get that chance? But like 47 years felt uh, crazy to me. It does feel crazy. And, you know, listen, you talk about, you know, adoption, which I think is, a, you know, legal, legal <laughs> consensual adoption, I think is a beautiful thing. I think there's a yeah. lot of children that need homes. And I think that it's, you know, a, a beautiful thing. Um, And of course, you hear those stories about adopted children who eventually reconnect with their birth families. And usually there's, you know, reason and, and all of those kinds of things. But this, I mean, the idea that it's like this child was just kidnapped, was just taken. And that that's the reason it it wasn't like, you know, you would, you would willfully given the child up because of your circumstance. Right. You know, that, that of course is still emotional. Don't get me wrong. But the idea of 47 years later, finding your child who had been taken 
shortly after birth. I mean, yeah. that's intense. I mean, it feels like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is. Like it's, wow. I mean, there's, it's a lot. Again, it's, it's, it's been a week. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And they maintain this extensive database of m- all the missing children who are reported missing. If, if a child has been reported missing and haven't, that case isn't closed or they have not been found, they're going to be on there. Right. Um, they have a staff of four artists whose sole job is to create digitally enhanced age progression photos. The show did have some age progression photos. Right. Um, as of December 3rd, 2020, 251 kids are still missing in New York alone. Like the numbers of missing kids, I can't really think too much about it. However, due to this age progression technology and the uh, internet becoming as huge as it is and the creation of the Amber Alert system, the recovery rate of missing children has increased from 62%, which is what it was in like 1984 when this started, to 97% now. Wow. So That's amazing. That feels fantastic. Um, Obviously, 100 would be ideal. but Of course, but that is very hopeful. But that is, yes, that is definitely the right direction. Um, And one of these kids that was found, this was the, was mentioned on the episode, Um, in August of 1987, a baby named Carlina White was kidnapped from a hospital in Harlem. She was only 19 days old. She was running a fever. Her parents were worried. They took her to the hospital. A woman dressed as a nurse was like, I'll take her. I'll be right back. Um, she never came back. Um, years later... 24 years later, um, while trying to apply for college, Carlina finds out her social insurance number is fake and that her mother had abducted her when she was a baby. So So the woman who had posed as a nurse took this this child and raised her as her own. Yes. Apparently she had recently uh, miscarried and just mentally wasn't handling it and just i mean i can't even imagine and she just dressed like a nurse went and found a baby and was like perfect this one will do they literally handed her the baby because she's a nurse what else do you do right uh so in 2011 this girl who was born carlina white who is now nedra nance was reunited with her birth parents after 24 years Wow. So, I mean, that's something, right? And I mean, that's, uh, oh, absolutely. And I think that those are the stories, obviously, that are, that are amazing in all of this is, is that, you know, wow, the fact that she, she managed, unfortunately, it took that long, but, but it's amazing that she did eventually get to connect with them. Now, my question when I heard that story in the episode was, yeah. I wonder what kind of childhood and life she had with that mother, because- you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pass judgment. She's taken sure. a child. She's, ch- oh, she's yeah. taken a baby for her own, you know, wants. And yes. that is awful. And so that doesn't necessarily strike me as somebody who would be a great mother. Uh, now, I don't know if people are going to come at me about that, but I would say if you steal a baby, <laughs> I'm saying my, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. You disrespect there, okay? the child, you're done. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Bring her into my court. I got some things to say. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious because the, I don't know why my hearing that story, um, my heart was breaking for a million reasons. But one of sure. them was that I was like, wow, I wonder what that life was like. My hope upon hopes is that this was a woman who went through a troubled time, did something that was terrible, but was a great mom. That is my hope beyond hope that this- sure you know, taken child had a good life because, you know, the idea again, that somebody who maybe is, um, you know, acts in that way. Again, I think that's pretty extreme. Now, I, I, are sure. we going to get letters from listeners that are like, you're being too mean? I hope not. Because again, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm using the fact that she 
dressed as a nurse and then stole people's baby as as a I think that's a fair yeah. thing to judge, don't you? That's a fair thing well, to judge. I mean, I feel like the word that comes to mind for me is desperate. Yes. She was desperate for a child. She wanted to, you know, have that experience and it just wasn't working for her. And she was devastated um, by the recent loss of her child. And she just couldn't think of another thing to do than to bring another child in. And what's a safer way than having a child that's already here and you don't have to worry about a pregnancy or whatever. Again, I don't condone what she did. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's a lot. I mean, I don't, I haven't read too much about Carlina, but I don't think her childhood was negative. Great. Cause I mean, she, me feel she went her whole life not having a clue that anything was up. Right. So I don't think her childhood was terrible, but at the same time, I mean, who's going to love you more than the parents who wanted you that, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, you could argue that this woman deeply wanted her as well, but, but again, it true. just, to me, it's, you know, there's a lot of people obviously that deeply want children that can't have them for a multitude of, of very sad reasons. And they're not all going and stealing babies is my point. You oh know? yeah. She didn't go about this the right way. There could have been so many other ways to handle this, but she just had a moment and yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. But I mean, if you like that story of yeah. people being reunited. I do. I've got more for you. I'd love to hear them. So there's this guy named Steve Carter. He was adopted as a child. Um, he saw Carlina's story on the news and had a thought of like, you know what? Maybe it's time. I need to look into my background. I need to check out my past. So he starts like browsing things online. He ends up on a page for missing children and he finds a photo of himself as a baby. Oh, wow. He finds, yeah. Uh, he finds out now this was in 2012. He finds out that he was actually born Mark's Panama Barnes. He was taken by his mother from his home in Hawaii in 1977 when he was six months old. She changed their names, and shortly after, she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital, and then she was discharged, and she took off. So he was left uh, in the system and was adopted out by a lovely family, and he grew up to have um, a great childhood and all of that, but... 35 years after going missing, he was finally able to find out who he was wow. and, and meet his dad. So again, so this was his biological mother yes. that took him and wow. Yes. So he because, met his father. Yeah. Because that's great. The, the biological mother has not been seen since. Wow. She left that psychiatric hospital, never looked back. She just vanished. So I don't know why she was admitted there in the first place. But I don't know. It's wow. just, it's, it's nice to have that hope of like after that many years. Well, and this is the thing, know? right? Hearing these stories when it's, you know, 20, 30, 47 years, it does give you hope that, that you know, I, I really do hope that, you know, Christopher and Shane and Andre all do eventually get reunited with their families. I mean, of course it's way too late and it's, it's always a tragedy, no matter how you slice it. But um, you know, this does give me hope that I, I hope that they do end up becoming reunited. And I hope that, that yeah. being on unsolved mysteries really kind of gives this a platform so that it gets more eyes on it. And maybe someone will see a similarity. Um, now, are there yeah. other cases? Are there other cases? Uh, there are, um, there is um, similar to Carlina's story by being kidnapped by a woman that was dressed as a nurse. Oh, God. It's a huge thing. It was... Is it? Everywhere in this. Um, like, I, there are so many cases that I didn't bring up that that's how it started. Wow. Um, but similar to her, so 
this girl uh, was born, uh, forgive me, I'm not sure, Kimye Mobley. Um, in 1998, uh, she was taken from a hospital in Florida when she was eight hours old. Oh my God. The kidnapper raised the child as her own and she was so close with her and their relationship was so tight that this woman broke down and told her in 2017 that you're actually not my daughter. I did kidnap you when you were a baby. Um, the daughter chose to stay silent. Interesting. The police got a tip of this girl's real identity. So they approached her and it came out she is in fact this uh, Kim Ye, but she was, her, she was currently going by the name Alexis and she'd been missing for 19 years and she was um, reunited with her birth mother. Um, the woman who abducted her did go to jail. She's serving 18 years for abducting her. Alexis or Kim Ye or Kim Ya, however we're going to say that, um, still is in contact with her, with the woman in prison, and still refers to her as her mom. Wow. Because again, they were super tight. She had a great relationship with her her whole life. And then it's like, oh yeah, you're not actually mine. And the kid was just like, I kind of am, you know, like it's just <laughs> that, that was it. Wow. Um, that's interesting. The other thing I thought you might like about that particular case, it's the basis for a Lifetime movie that came out in January. Ah. Yeah. What's uh, it called? Stolen by My Mother, the Kimye, Kimya Mobley story. It mm. stars Niecy Nash, which let's get on board because who doesn't fucking love her? Of course. Have you seen Claws? Oh my not. Oh my fucking God. If you want female empowerment and if you want to feel like a badass bitch, that's what primes you. <laughs> Cause well, you've clearly been watching it on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's uh, she, watching her be a badass makes me feel like Brandy without the Brandy. Oh my God, she might be my spirit animal. How many oh spirit animals gosh. can you have? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I love her so much. Okay, okay. I, I'm, yeah. I'm processing a lot right now and you're going to love so what sorry. I'm- No, you're going to love what I'm going back to. When are we watching this Lifetime movie? Like that's high on my list. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm assuming that Niecy Nash then, does she play the kidnapping mom? Bingo. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait for this. Yeah. Yeah, it came out in January. We need to, like, really what we need to do is start a list for the next time we're able to be in the same room. Like, I don't have a pen, so yeah. we're just going to use this as our list. One, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to want to watch Stolen by My Mother. <laughs> Two, we're going to want nachos. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, three. <laughs> Danny Duquette episodes of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> That's it. You know what? I, got, I want to tell you something very quickly, very quick aside. Yeah. I stumbled onto something called Stan Twitter, which is the part of Twitter where um, people who really love stuff talk about it. And oh, okay, like, there's yeah. a lot of superstore stands. And so- As there should be. Thank you very much. And so I was interacting with some of them on there. And then I kind of just got into the Malay and people started asking me about things that I like. And one of the things that came out, people were asking me like, do you watch Grey's Anatomy? Or I, so I said, Denny Duquette forever. And I got a lot of hate. I got a lot Why? of hate. Apparently there is a contingent of people that really hate Denny. And of course there's a contingent of people that hate Izzy. Obviously. Everybody should. <laughs> yeah. 
but I got so much hate and I just kept saying, I was like, and then, and then they got into like ghost Denny and I'm like, I'm not talking about ghost Denny. I, no. I'm talking about the original Denny Duquette episodes. Mm-hmm. I love him. And I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. You know what? I don't feel guilty about it. There. I said it. And you shouldn't, you Thank should you. be allowed to love who you want to love. Thank you. And if that Denny person Duquette, is Denny Duquette, then that's just what it is. It's not our fault he has John Winchester's face. <laughs> Look. Yeah. I get it, because as you know, I'm 100% Denny Duquette of on board. I'm also 100% fuck Izzy <laughs> is where I'm at. I don't, I don't like her. I've never cared for her. I just don't like the character. I have a lot of issues with that. Um, and so I didn't... <laughs> This is going to be bold. And I say this kind of stuff about TV and movie characters all the time. So it feels right. Yeah. I don't think that Izzy deserved Denny. I agree. And I was pissed that it was her that he was leaning towards. I can't think of who in the moment I would have wanted him to be with. But like, I also am so tired of that show. I love it. And I will watch it till the bitter end. Yeah. I'm very behind on it currently, but I will continue to watch it till the bitter end. But what they do, and I'm getting in close because I'm mad. I want to hear it. They bring in a character that I love. And they make me love them more than I thought humanly possible. And then I love them again. And then they're fucking dead. And then they take you like this and they take just the littlest shiv and they just jam it in your kidneys. They jam it in there. I know. I know. Denny Duquette. And this is going to be a gray spoiler for everybody. I don't know who, if you watch it, you watch it and you're up to date. Uh, (laughs) Denny Duquette (laughs) says the woman who just said, I'm not up to date. Uh, Denny Duquette. Yep. George. Yeah. And the character, I can't think of what was his name? Scott Foley? Oh, yeah. Teddy's husband? Yep. yep. Nope. And, uh, I mean, obviously, both the McSteamy McDreamy. Yeah. What the it's fuck, a blood Grace? Bath. It's a bloodbath at Seattle Grace. Like, can we talk about that for a second? Like, think about, think about this in real life. They've had active, active shooters. They've had planes go down. They've had, like, you know, it's, it's a lot of death. I I wouldn't normally think that the staff of a hospital would go through so much death in real life. But um, yeah, listen, I stopped watching a couple of years ago because my show Superstore was on at the same day and time as Grey's Anatomy. And so I was like, I feel like I have to like give my show the ratings, of course, um, which is ridiculous. But anyway, long story short, long story short, I feel like I always have a soft spot for it. I think it's time for me to get back in. Because I'd like to shoulder some of your pain, is my point. Well, (laughs) I don't even know how to warn you. Yeah. There's some shit with Alex that... Oh, no. You love Alex. I want to throw a chair through a window. (laughs) Again, as a redhead, I like... uh, I'm a little bit throwy. (laughs) You know, <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't, I don't like to splurge when it comes to limes and I like to throw <laughs> shit. That's who I am in a nutshell. Uh, and I just, yeah, I love Alex so much. And again, also why I fucking hate Izzy because she had to get in there with Alex and I was just, no, but I have a lot. Of, I have a lot. Of, again, we could. Well, podcast number five, Grey's Anatomy. I was just get out of my head. I was just gonna say when Where we start we our Grey's back, Anatomy podcast, we go back to the beginning, and we watch the episodes like we've never watched them before. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, yeah. And then we're like, Denny Duquette, who is this new character? We're gonna get in this. Oh, people know we're lying. Yeah, <laughs> people seen- will know. People will know. Yeah. It's okay. We're, I think we'll love it. But yeah, that's easily podcast five at this point, right? 
I don't even know what number we're on yet. And frankly, I'm excited about it. Um, all right, we got to wrap things up. So yeah. is there anything else you wanted to hit on? Any other stories or anything that you did, you uncovered you wanted to share? Um, I mean, there were a couple others that had gone missing. One was missing for 19 years. Another was missing for 13 years. Um, most most seem to be like they were taken by some sort of family member. One was taken by his paternal grandparents because they got in a disagreement with the child's parents. And so they kidnapped him, took him to another state, changed all their names, but left his birthday and his social insurance number. So when the police started looking into it years later, they found someone with the same birth date, same social insurance number, who conveniently looked a lot like the age progressed photo that they had of this child. Turns out it is him. Um, and that was, he'd been missing for 19 years. There was another kid. He was applying for college in 2015. His uh, social insurance number didn't match his name. And his school counselor's like, it's okay, we'll figure this out. Well, that poor counselor found out more than he bargained for because this <laughs> child was missing. Oh, my God. Uh, they found out that he had been taken by his biological father uh, when he was five years old, 13 years before that. Wow. And, of course, because these kids are raised so lovingly by these people, they're just like, I don't want anything bad to happen to them because they took me. And it's like, I understand that. But at the same time, it's like, do you have any idea what they put the parent through, the other parent who didn't take the child or... You know, like I just, right. I don't know. And again, it's not on the kids. I'm not blaming the kids. This is no. not their fault. Um, so I have a kind of weird one. Okay. So in Chicago in 1964, a baby was taken. His name is Paul Franczak. He was taken by a woman dressed as a nurse. Again, keeps coming up. Um, this prompted an intense nationwide search. It generated worldwide headlines, but there was just no leads. Two years go by. It's 1966. A toddler is found abandoned in New Jersey. The police show this child to Dora and Chester, who are the parents of the baby who went missing. And at this point, it's only been two years. They're still grieving. Um, they show this child to him and, or to the parents and the parents go, yeah, okay, sure. He's our son. Yeah. So they take him in, adopt him as their own child. Okay. So they raise him as Paul. This is just who he is. So the new Paul, uh, kind of gets like inklings on like something's not right and this isn't right. And he wants to like figure out what's going on. And in 2013, he starts, uh, by this point, his, his mother has told him the truth of he was taken from a hospital and they just miraculously found him two years later, you know, in another state. And we just don't want to think about it. Right. We're just, you're Paul, we're moving on. And he didn't want to, he had to like push his parents to do like DNA tests because they just weren't interested. They were like, you're our Paul, it doesn't matter. But he was like, no, right. let's do this. So 2013 rolls around. He does the news circuit to get his story out there to try and find maybe if he, because he wants to figure out what's going on. Um, DNA tests were done. He was not the original Paul, which nobody was really surprised by. Uh, but two years later, the adult children of a man from Michigan took DNA tests because they thought the age progressed photo looked like their dad. And it seemed like, cause they were pretty sure he was adopted as a child and all this kind of stuff. Well, it real, it, their DNA test came back and it showed that their father was the real Paul who had been kidnapped from the hospital uh, when he was like one day old. So this guy doesn't didn't want to go in public he didn't want his name out there he was battling cancer he didn't want to deal with becoming like a a sideshow so he just like was like nope not interested he did however he did uh have phone calls with the mom 
So she was able to actually speak with her son again. So she, her other son, I should say, because right, um, the other guy, the new Paul, is she raised him as her son. So he was also her son. Of course. It doesn't matter if you give birth to a child or not. If you're raising them, they are your child. Of course. Um, so he did have contact with her. So she got to have contact with him. Uh, he did unfortunately die earlier this year. Um, and so the other Paul is like, well, I'm not Paul at all. So who the hell am I? So he has paid money for his own investigators and DNA experts. And they actually found his birth family. They found out his name is actually Jack Rosenthal. Um, His parents, unfortunately, have passed, so he never got to meet them. But he has siblings, uh, including a brother who heard his story and went, oh, this is a scam and won't speak to him. Um, He learned he has a twin sister who's never been found. Oh, my God. The two of them went missing. He apparently showed up at this place in Jersey and the cops were like, who knows this kid? Nobody did. So he went to uh, the Frank, the Frank Zach family. We have no idea what happened to the sister. Uh, he has written a book about his journey and is making the circuit on that. So I did not read the book because I did not have time and I learned about it too late. But, of course, but that's but, a fascinating story. My goodness. Yeah, I can't even imagine. No. Oh, no. Gosh. Well, listen, we made it through. Christy Oxborough, I think you brought some great stuff to the table here. I think that there's, you know, these stories of hope. Again, it's in a very unfortunate situations. We, we have to hope that these people will be reunited with their biological families. Um, and again, like I said before, I do hope that, that, you know, featuring this on Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix, which has global reach. I really do hope that it may, you know, have some people come forward and some questions get answered. Um, but I appreciate you as always. I appreciate all your work. It's, uh, it's been a journey. I should say since the episode aired. Yeah. Um, both Christopher and Shane's mother have given DNA samples to put into the database So now if any kid, or I guess at this point there'd be men, but if any man comes forward thinking he might be, he can give a sample and they can uh, try and check it out. So that helps get them a step further. They just need to find potential people who might be. But of course, there's still hope, I guess, is what we're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I look forward to hopefully getting an update on, on that case in traditional Unsolved Mysteries fashion. Yeah. Now, it should be noted, we have come to the end of these new Unsolved Mysteries episodes on Netflix. I mean, we have covered all of them at this point, which is yes. amazing. It feels like we've been doing this for 30 weeks, but we, we haven't. <laughs> um, we yes. haven't actually at this point. Um, but obviously we introduced a Dateline mystery last week, which was a super fun thing. And yeah. we do have a very special episode coming next week. Uh, we've toyed around with a couple of different names for it, but what we've settled on is next week being a very special episode called... The True Crime and Cocktails Holiday Hoot Nanny. <laughs> and what does that involve, you may wonder? Well, we don't know yet. It's basically just our shenanigans. We thought it would be nice to kind of wrap up, um, you know, the holiday season. Not wrap up the holiday season, but, you know, come, kind of wrap up all of these Unsolved Mysteries episodes with a fun holiday episode. Now, it also should be noted, we do have fan theory episodes coming. Yes. So if you have a theory about this case, about any case that we have covered thus far, all of these new unsolved mysteries, the Dateline mystery, please email us theories at truecrimeandcocktails.com because we are going to do at least one, if not two, depending on how many theories we get and depending how long, you know, they go, we are going to do those featuring your theories and we want to hear them because we know that you have them. If you didn't, you probably wouldn't listen to the show. Um, So that's coming up too. So a lot of exciting things. And then I know what everybody's thinking. People are panicking. We got asked this from day one. What are you going to do when you run out of the Unsolved Mysteries episodes? This is something that's on people's mind. And let me tell you, we hear you. You have been heard. We have something very exciting coming in the new year. I feel like maybe we want to leave it a little secret for a little bit longer. But what we can guarantee you 
is that true crime and cocktails is going to continue. We're going to be talking about more true crime. We're not going to leave you wanting, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to say fortunately for us, but un, unfortunately, there's a lot of true crime out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're, uh, we're not going to be hurting for topics. Exactly. And at this point, I have seen a lot of comments about like, where is the science podcast? And like, <laughs> you know, so who knows what the next thing will be, but it will, true crime and cocktails will still live on. We want to, we want to keep this train on track. We I don't do. Know why it's always a train, but. Well, I think it's, we're going off the rails on a crazy train. Um, oh, I can't afford that. Can't Gotta stop singing. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. listen. It's very exciting. We promise you that we love doing this show so very much and we, are, we have no intentions of stopping. If Netflix releases a new batch of Unsolved Mysteries, I'm sure we'll tackle those when that happens. Yeah. But until then, what I promise you is we've got lots of great stuff coming. There is nothing but true crime and cocktails going to come your way. Um, quick reminder, we remind you all the time, Make sure you go to our Instagram, True Crime and Cocktails, to get the virtual case files that Christy posts. If you want a more in-depth one, go to our website, truecrimeandcocktails.com, where the unedited Zoom episodes live, where you can watch us slowly devolve into drunkenness as we record each week. Um, I'm so excited yeah. about the holiday episode next week. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. And yeah, uh, yeah. until next time. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Night, people. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.